Welcome to Pleasant Green Sunday School. This is Lesson 9 for April the 26th, 2015. We're still in Unit 2, entitled The Community of Beloved Disciples. Our topic for today, taken from the Adult Quarterly, is Fraud Alert. Fraud Alert. Devotion reading is taken from Galatians chapter 6, uh, verses 6 through 10. Our background scripture is the first epistle of John chapter 5, verses 6 through 12, uh, verses 18 through 20, and the second epistle of John. The print passage today is the second epistle of John, uh, verses 1 uh, through 13, the entire epistle of Second John. A key verse reads, Watch out that you do not lose what you have worked for, but that you, you may be f- rewarded fully. That's uh, Second Epistle of John, uh, verse 8. And that is the uh, NIV translation. Our lesson aims today, number one, is to Research John's caution to beware of those who do not abide in Christ's teachings. Number two, reflect on their emotional responses to teachings that are contrary to what they have been previously taught. And number three, testify that walking in Jesus' commandment to love protects the faith community from deceivers and corruption. We have three... uh, Uh, outlines that uh, we will be discussing today. The first one is entitled United by the Truth. The second one is entitled Walking in the Truth. And the third outline is entitled Guarding the Truth. We certainly thank and praise God again for the privilege of being able to share another word with you from our uh, Sunday School lesson. Uh, One that is really needed uh, in our time, uh, just as it was in John's day. uh, There were false teachers uh, trying to infiltrate uh, the church, uh, get amongst the believers, and that is the issue today. And we hope that uh, whatever we say to you today will help you uh, and encourage you to know the word of God for yourself, to be on guard, to watch out, to look to yourselves uh, and your soul. Uh, It's very important. But uh, as we looked at this lesson, uh, we have quite a bit to cover, even though we're uh, just studying 13 uh, verses. Uh, But there's a lot of background, and we're going to give you uh, some scriptures to support Uh, our findings, and and hopefully you'll uh, gain some insight. But to be a fraud uh, is someone that's deceitful, uh, who is is tricky, uh, one that is not uh, what it seems or is represented, someone that's an imposter. You know, and as I studied this lesson, uh, I was thinking about uh, the fact that, uh, you know, as we are faced with uh, fraudulent people, deceitful people, uh, what does the imposter want with the believer? Uh, That's a very important question, and we hope that uh, we can see here that uh, these false teachers they were looking for disciples as well in addition to attacking Christianity as a whole. So this biblical context for our lesson given in the quarterly, we're going to read some from our standards so we can get a a very good background of uh, what was going on in John's day. And we hope that you'll go back and read the devotional reading, the background scripture that we gave you, and certainly the printed text. The biblical context is as follows. The second epistle of John is in the form of a personal letter. His purpose for writing is similar to that of the book of 1 John. 
false teachers were traveling from congregation to congregation, promoting their erroneous doctrine. John's concern uh, was that his readers continue to walk in truth and love by being obedient to the things that they had been taught and that they refuse to show any hospitality to these false teachers who were attempting to make inroads into their congregations. And from our standard, uh, we have three epistles that were written by the Apostle John, the former Galilean fisherman. You can see some reference in Mark chapter 1, verse 16 through 20. Uh, we do not know the order in which these were written. They are simply arranged by length in the New Testament. And so here, uh, there are connections among all three as well as with the Gospel of John. Early tradition associates all five works by John with the churches in and around the great city of Ephesus, a leading me metropolitan center of the Roman Empire of the first century A.D., John probably wrote his letters in the A.D. 80s and the early 90s. Therefore, the recipients included the second generation of believers since Paul's time in the area. You can see reference in Acts chapter 19. Troubling things had happened since then. Toward the end of his life, Paul wrote two letters in this regard to his younger colleague, Timothy, who was in Ephesus to help the church with doctrinal and organizational matters. Thus the battle for truth was already being waged there in the AD 60s. It is after this period that Ephesus seems to have become a center for a burgeoning Christian heresy called Gnosticism. This movement claimed to have special knowledge of Christ. The word Gnosis means knowledge. The Gnostics taught that Jesus had not been fully human but was a divine visitation of deity to earth, something like in the legends of the Greek gods. Since a non-human immortal Jesus could not really die on the cross, the Gnostics did not teach that Jesus' death was an atoning sacrifice for sins. Instead, they taught that salvation came from secret knowledge, from being enlightened, to esoteric truths that Jesus had taught only to the inner circle of his disciples. Gnosticism seems not to have uh, developed fully as a rival version of Christianity until after the end of the first century AD, but its seeds were being sown in John's day. Thus, his need to address in his letters Gnostic-type falsehoods. Very important foundation here, uh, as it was in John's day and it is in our day. Uh, people that don't believe that Jesus came in the flesh, uh, that he was born of the Virgin Mary. Uh, and so this is what was going on. And so these Gnostics, these false teachers, they went about uh, uh, trying to uh, get into the church amongst the believers and upset their faith and cause them uh, great harm and, and, and ultimately to take them captive uh, to their teaching and to their, their way of life and to their doctrine. You know, and that's very important today. And, uh, you know, there are times, and, and I know we can all relate, uh, uh, that, that our faith has been upset. There are some teachings that contradict what we have been taught what our ancestors taught us, our grandparents, uh, in some cases our parents have taught us and our pastors have taught us. There's a lot of teaching that uh, have similarity to the gospel, but they make uh, certain tweaks, if you will, and they take the word of God out of context and it causes sometimes amongst even uh, uh, some of the new converts it upsets our faith. And, and I can tell you from personal experience, there are many times that my faith has been uh, upset because of different things said about the gospel or directed toward what our belief systems uh, uh, are and, and the place that they're in. 
So it's very important that we know the Word of God. And we're going to say that quite a, quite a bit throughout this lesson because uh, for you to be uh, convicted and have all of the foundation, uh, uh, foundational security and assurances that the way and, and what you believe is accurate, uh, we cannot uh, uh, overemphasize because that is what we need today. We need to be rooted and grounded. You don't hear that term too much now, but the lesson says be careful. There's a fraud alert. Uh, there are some folks that have gone out. They're already out into the world. They're already blending in. They're already mixing in. They're already uh, infiltrating the churches and, and, and taking uh, uh, some of our believers captive into other doctrines. So we have to be careful. So, But we're going to share some things as we get into this lesson today. And we hope that, uh, and, and, and that you stay prayerful uh, 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 not to sample all of these different things. Uh, if you, uh, it's so important that we carry a Bible to church, that we attend Bible classes and and Bible study and Sunday school. You need these foundational truths. You need to be thoroughly convicted of what you believe and how that you are connected to Jesus Christ. Because there are many, many doctrines out here today. There are many, many people uh, 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 that are dressed up and, and, and we believe that God has sent them. Uh, uh, and so uh, we come to find out that God has not. So the first outline here uh, is entitled United by the Truth. This is the second epistle of John, uh, verses 1 through 4. I'm going to read this from the NIV translation. The Bible says, The elder to the chosen lady and her children, whom I love in the truth, and not I only, but also all who know the truth, because of the truth which lives in us and will be with us forever. Grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and from Jesus Christ the Father's Son will be with us in truth and love. It has given me great joy to find some of your children walking in the truth just as the Father commanded us. I should tell you there is a, a great debate uh, uh, you know, uh, with uh, John's uh, greeting here, uh, he defines himself as an elder, calls himself an elder. He says to the chosen lady, uh, uh, there is some that believe that this is symbolic, uh, that he was addressing the church and her children obviously would be uh, other believers. Uh, there are others, and even in this uh, lesson outline, that uh, hold that this was uh, a woman that uh, that was called and that was chosen, uh, that uh, held church uh, in her house, and and uh, John obviously was close to, uh, uh, felt the need to write uh, to her and to her children uh, uh, that. The Bible says here, whom I love in the truth. But we don't want to uh, 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 get so tangled up in that uh, this uh, symbolism or actual person and children that John is addressing. We want to pay attention to the content uh, of what he is saying here because it does, uh, and I'm sure uh, uh, John is concerned about the believers here we learned in our background uh, that the believers there is a threat and back in this time we are uh, going to give you some scripture here there were some that held church services in their houses uh, uh, and so that was not uncommon uh, in John's day but uh, uh, nevertheless we understand that here uh, John is saying here that I love in the truth and not I only but also all uh, who know the truth so he loves all of those and keep in mind our unit 2 is entitled the community 
of beloved disciples. And this is very important. We ought to love one another. We ought to love all uh, people. We ought to certainly love all of those and do good to all of those as Galatians 6 helps us understand who are of the household of faith. He said, because of the truth which lives in us. You know, there's so many people uh, looking for the truth, uh, trying to find uh, the accurate knowledge of of God and his origin and, and of Jesus Christ. But Jesus said these words in the 14th chapter of John. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. The truth is in Jesus. And if we have Christ, the truth is in us. And he goes on to say, and will be with us forever. If you go over in John chapter 14, Jesus said these exact same words to his disciples concerning the Holy Spirit. He said he will be with you in, uh, uh, in you forever. He says grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and from Jesus Christ. You know, the grace and the mercy and the peace that we have because we have fellowship with God because we have the truth, which is in Jesus. So we have this oneness. Uh, uh, again, back over in John chapter 14, you will see a uh, 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 reference there. Uh, he said, which will, which will be with us in truth and love. It has given me great joy to find some of your children walking in the truth. You know, it's very important that we stay with the gospel. I know that it is tough and we are facing some some of the most difficult times of our age, but it's it's a blessing for us to still maintain our integrity in the Lord. It's very important. I know it's popular to go to the left and and some are saying many things, but it's a blessing when you can stay with what you started with. They used to teach us that in the church as uh, uh, I was a boy growing up. Uh, stay with what you with, with uh, what you start with, uh, and he says here, just as the Father commanded us. You know, it's a blessing to be able to hold fast and hold on to God's unchanging hand, even in the difficult time. And we know we have all of these different doctrines and all of these different things are being said and taught. But it's a, it's a blessing that we can hold fast to what the Lord have given us in this outline here uh, for these verses. It says in the opening verses, second John verses one through four, John repeated the word truth five times to highlight the, its importance. John's expression of his deep affection for the recipients of this epistle was not mere sentimentalism, but was an expression of his appreciation for their acceptance of God's truth. He and others familiar with this lady and her children were bound to them in love by this truth. You know, in this community, let me just say this about this community. We share the same belief. There are no unsaved people in this community. We all share the same uh, uh, belief. We, uh, just like it says in Romans uh, uh, chapter 10, verse 8, 9, and 10, we are saved because of what we believe, the testimony that God gave concerning his son. And that binds us together in this faith community. It says, a beloved disciple, we all believe the same thing. And, 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 if, and if that's the case, that we are connected to God through Jesus Christ of this great salvation, then it's important for us to understand that we have to love one another because that was why Jesus came. It was because of love. The Father gave, uh, uh, it's John 3.16, for God so loved the world, he gave his son. So we have uh, uh, connected with God through the love uh, that he has given to us through Jesus Christ. And then we love one another. This is our bond. So it was very important. And John uh, uh, found it necessary to encourage them that it was a blessing to find them still walking in what they started with. So it goes on to say here, the basis for love among believers is their acceptance of and obedience to the truth and is also the basis for showing Christian hospitality. John's motivation for writing was because of and for the sake of the truth, which he declared would abide in believers forever. 
As believers obey the truth and demonstrate genuine love, they receive divine blessings of grace, mercy, and peace, which enables them to live in unity. Why can't we live in unity? If we all believe on the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, we ought to have some unity amongst us. John was elated to have observed some of uh, those who, whom he wrote committed to living out the truth and thus living out the commandments of God. The book of John of Second John was a call to consistently obey the truth. That is very, very important. You know, it's good to say that you have faith, but we must continuously obey the commandments. That is the greatest test of our faith. Jesus said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. How can people know that you love the Lord except you keep the commandments of God? This is what the world needs to see. And this is our, and that we love the brethren. This is the greatest uh, manifestation we can have is to obey God and to love one another. So the same call is issued to the church today. Only as the church obeys the commandments of God can she walk in love and unity. See that? So it's very important that we keep the commandments of God, that we obey Him at all costs. And be careful and mindful that there are other things, there are other folks, there are other teachings that teach us, you know, we were talking about this a couple of weeks ago uh, uh, in our Sunday school class about how this false doctrine causes disruption in the church, how it causes this, you know, us to uh, 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 fall out with one another. You, you can tell it's confusing and, 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 and all of these different things are going on and it keeps us divided. And we have to understand that God is not in that plan. We ought to love one another. God is not the author of confusion. But these teachings, these new teachings, new doctrines, there is nothing new under the sun. And we have to be careful. So the question is asked here in the quarterly, what are the basic truths that unite your local congregation? We said that earlier about how we came to uh, 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 to be saved. These are basic things uh, uh, that Jesus was born of the Virgin Mary. These are things that, 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 that we have to believe and move on and progress in the faith. Uh, uh, there is no Christian uh, uh, that should still be struggling with these basics. We have to understand that, that God gave us His only begotten Son. And if we have believed on the truth and accepted these foundational truths, uh, 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 in the message that God has given us concerning his son, we have to hold those teachings and build on those teachings. So that's very important. How is what your congregation believes to be visibly demonstrated true? So we said that earlier. We need to see uh, the manifestation of our faith. Uh, and the world. We need, certainly need to see it in the church, and, and the world needs to see it at large. The second outline is entitled Walking in the Truth. This is the second epistle of John, uh, verses 5 through 7, again from the NIV translation. And now, dear lady, I am not writing uh, a, you a new command, but one we have had from the beginning. I ask that we love one another, and this is love, that we walk in obedience to his commands. As you have heard from the beginning, his command is that you walk in love. Verse 7, many deceivers who do not acknowledge Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh have gone out into the world. And any such person is the deceiver and the antichrist. So we, we were talking about this, uh, uh, we, what John is saying here from the beginning. You know, ever since the, uh, the early church, uh, that uh, the disciples, the followers of Christ, were taught this command. So this was nothing new. Uh, uh, again, there's nothing new under the sun. We've heard this stuff before, but we have to continue to abide in this, in this love, in this obedience. And this is our, uh, uh, our shield, if you will, against all other doctrines, because 
uh, these doctrines that are against or anti-Christ, they come in and they pick and they choose and they take sides and they pit one against the other. And Christ is not in that. We are to love one another. We are in this community together. So he goes on to say, this is what the love should look like, that we walk in obedience to his commands, as you have heard from the beginning. God has not changed that command. God has not changed his message to us. God has not given us any new directive about this. This is the way it should be. He has not changed that in any doctrine that 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 comes on that tells us that we don't have to do that. There's been some new twist, some new change. We know uh, that that is not of God. Verse seven, he says, many deceivers. There's so many. Uh, that are scattered all over the world. They were scattered all over the world then and they are now. Who do not acknowledge Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh. How many times do we hear that uh, uh, these days about Jesus? He was a prophet. He was this. He was that. Uh, uh, he didn't come. He did come. And all these different things. What do we believe? God gave his only begotten son. The first epistle of John chapter 1 uh, throughout chapter 5 is excellent foundation. John really dealt with this uh, uh, Jesus coming in the flesh. And you know, this is where we should get our joy from. It's from the truth. If we know the truth, then we are excited about that. But it goes on to say here that this is an antichrist. You know, this is this teaching, these individuals are against Christ, they are against the teaching of Christ. You know, and it, 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 it as I as I said that the Spirit of the Lord reminded me that you know don't take it personal when these folks oppose you. They are oppose this anti Christ. They are against Christ, and certainly since we are His followers, they are against us, and they are deceptive. They are very uh, tricky in their methods and how they uh, attract believers and and how they. Uh, twist the word of God that appeals to us in such a way that we need to follow it. So we have to be careful. And, and, and they are very good. Uh, Genesis chapter 3 tells us about saying that he is more crafty than any other created thing. So he is very deceptive and his agents are very deceptive uh, in, in what they teach. The outline here says John's primary purpose for writing his epistle was to warn his followers about those who made negative inroads and were causing dissension and defection. We see so much of this going on today, and I always have encouraged believers. Sometimes they, they want to venture out and go to other churches and experience other ministries, and I always tell them, if the Lord did not tell you to do that, then you need to stay put. If you're not ready to, to, to handle all of these different truths. You don't know what you're going to run into. You don't know what they're going to tell you, what sort of yokes that they may put up on you and burdens that may cause you to stumble and fall. So we have to be careful. And John is warning uh, his followers that, look, these people are out here. Be careful. And, and this is how we need to protect ourselves. And that's very important. Uh, uh, watch out for people who cause dissension amongst believers and, and defection. This this apostasy. We we are, we have moved away from what we believed, and now we're doing something different. Uh, those are suspect uh, individuals, and we have to be careful because it's it's getting worse by the day. After having greeted the commend and commended. The recipients of this second uh, epistle, John explained his purpose. Initially, he reminded his readers of the primacy of the commandment to demonstrate love, not as mere sentiment, but as a way of life for believers. This commandment was not new to them because they had been taught it and had accepted it as truth. The command to walk in love, John said, is demonstrated by obedience to all of God's commands. That's very important. As he had previously taught, it is impossible to love God and others without being obedient to all he has commanded. If they walk in obedience, they would be able to discern 
deceivers and the Antichrist, those in particular who were denying the incarnation of Jesus Christ. You know, that is one of the uh, uh, gifts, if you will, according even to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, that the church is lacking. It lacks discernment. It lacks the uh, uh, being able to know the difference between what is righteous and unrighteous. And that's why the church has become so infected with sin is because we didn't see or we couldn't see or we didn't understand. It. But uh, nevertheless, we are responsible for what has happened uh, uh, in the church because we have allowed it to come in. And now we have deception uh, uh, in Defection running rampant in the house of God. But if we would love one another, there's a remedy for what ails us today. And John is giving us a heavy dose and have been for the last few weeks that we have been studying his gospel. Uh, that that we ought to love one another. It is a cure all. Uh, if we would take into account what the Lord has said, we would be uh, surely uh, uh, well served. It goes on to say their walking in love would validate the message of the truth while exposing the fallacy of the message of false teachers. If the church desires to have what it professes to, to believe accepted by a lost world, it is imperative that her members practice walking in love by obeying the commandments of God. You know, we can put the devil to a flight if we simply obey God. We don't have to entertain. We don't have to compromise. We don't have to adhere to all of the lies. We have to know the truth for ourselves. And when we hear and, be, and we are being tempted to hate our brothers and sisters, we ought to have a word. Second Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, 17 tells us how to use the word of God uh, even to defend ourselves. And sometimes we have to rebuke the enemy don't allow the enemy to tell you and convince you that God would approve you hating your brothers and your sisters uh, uh, whom you see every day. But how can you love God whom you have never seen? That's very important for us to understand. So we need to show the love that God has placed in our hearts toward one another. And then we'll have uh, uh, the foundation that we need to build upon all of our ministries and evangelistic efforts are useless unless we make God's love visible through our lives to those whom we are trying to reach. So if we're going out, if we want our message to be effective in the world, we're going to have to demonstrate the love uh, that we should have amongst ourselves before we can bring others in. Here's a very important question in the quarterly. It says, how can we protect the local church from false teachers who distort or misrepresent God's word today. We have to be responsible and proactive about these things when they come. And we have to make sure that we don't allow these, these uh, 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 teachings and, 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 and these doctrines to, to ruin uh, 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 and upset our faith when we know the truth. We see this stuff going on. We know it's wrong. So it's our responsibility to do something about it. And here... The last outline is entitled Guarding the Truth. This is the second epistle of John, verses 8 through 13. Again, from the NIV translation. The Bible says, Watch out that you do not lose what you have worked for, but that you may be rewarded fully. Anyone who runs ahead and does not continue in the teaching of Christ does not have God. Whoever continues in the teaching has both the Father and the Son. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not take him into your house or welcome him. Verse 11. Anyone who welcomes him shares in his wicked work. I have much to write to you, but I do not want to use paper and ink. Instead, I hope to visit you and talk with you face to face so that our joy may be complete. Uh, verse 13, the children of your chosen sister send their greetings. So again, what does John mean when he is talking about continuing, continuing in the teaching of Christ? 
Now you're talking about Sunday school. Now you're talking about Bible class. Now you're talking about Christian education. Now you're talking about continuing to study to show thyself an approved workman unto God that need not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Do you see where we should be and how our lives should look like, how we should spend the rest of our days making sure that we are dwelling in the house of the Lord, that we are dwelling in the teaching. Uh, As Jesus said in John 15, he said, unless you uh, abide in me and my words, my words abide in you. So we have to abide in this thing. Uh, And so John is encouraging these believers here, uh, uh, don't just run ahead, but, but we need to continue. Don't stop learning. Don't stop trying to learn. Don't stop exposing yourself to the Christian uh, instruction uh, and environment. And so many times that is the biggest issue that we see in a lot of our churches today. Our our numbers are down in terms of prayer study, uh, a Bible class and, 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 and prayer and things like that. But don't you know, just like if you don't eat regular food, your body will get weak. If you stop feeding your spiritual man, your soul, you will get weak. Doesn't the Old Testament, I believe the book of Deuteronomy tells us that, that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. You must eat the word of God, and then you must digest the word of God. You have to continue in what Jesus said. You have to continue learning. There's nobody here Uh, on this earth that I'm aware of that has it all, that knows it all, and that has graduated somehow in instruction that they don't need it anymore. There are no such persons that are up on this earth. All of us have to abide in this teaching. So John is encouraging uh, these hearers uh, to stay with God, to stay with the word. And and he says, uh, uh, whoever continues in the teaching has both the Father and the Son. And then he goes on to tell us how to handle people who bring a different message to us. He says here, uh, do not take him into your house. Don't take him into your company. Don't take him into your fellowship. Don't take him uh, confidence in this individual. Don't welcome him. Don't become a partaker of these types of things. Because these things uh, are are sometimes in the subtleties of of the enemy of Satan. Uh, uh, he knows he's crafty. He knows how to get in and how to say pleasant things uh, to make us open up. And then we, once he gets inside, he uh, begins to uh, disrupt everything that he touches. So John is giving us some insight here on what to look for. He says in verse 11, anyone who welcomes him uh, 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 shares in his wicked work. I want you to go over and read Psalm 50, go down to about verse the uh, 16th verse and continue out that psalm, and you'll see some interesting scripture there. He says, I have much more uh, to write to you, but I don't want to write uh, uh, using paper and ink. He said, I want to see you. I, I want to see you face to face. I want to talk to you. You know, we, there's so much. We, we, we isolate ourselves so much from one another, and do, do you know God is not pleased with that. We ought to fellowship with one another. We ought to want to see one another. We ought to, uh, we ought not be satisfied locked up in our houses where we don't fellowship one with the other. We are a blessing to one another. God has so blessed you and he has so blessed me that when we come together, we ought to be able to share in our testimony together. We ought to be able to share in our joy together. We ought to be able to share in our gifts that God has given us to edify one another. We have so much that we should and can offer to one another. And John senses that. He said, I want to see you, you know, and I want my joy to be complete. It makes us complete when we fully expose all that we can and that we should toward one another. That makes our joy complete. But we rob ourselves of that joy when we ostracize ourselves from one another. We pit one believer against another. That is not the plan nor the will of God. John warned his readers of the inherent danger of providing hospitality 
Two are entertaining these deceivers and their doctrinally dangerous philosophies. The immediate danger is identified as the possibility of losing the fullness of the reward promised uh, for those who obey the truth by consorting with these false teachers or extending hospitality to them. All faithful believers are promised a reward in heaven for faithful service while here on earth. You can look at 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Uh, verse 10 through 15. However, those who prove unfaithful can forf forfeit uh, some of this reward. Not, not salvation, but we can, uh, 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 we can forfeit some of the blessing God had in store for us by uh, uh, compromising ourselves. Uh, so we have to be careful. We never know what God has in store for us. Uh, and so we have to be careful. John did not want this to happen to these believers. John continued his warning by reminding them of the danger of deviating from the truth and falling prey to the doctrine of these uh, false teachers. They were to reject any teaching that was not according to the scriptures. Oh, I wish we had time to really deal with that. You know, we ought to get out of these situations where uh, uh, I tell my Sunday school class that all the time. You know, if you hear me teaching contrary to the word of God, I expect you to get up and walk out. Don't sit here and allow all of that stuff in your spirit. And, you know, I should be able to qualify what I'm saying with scripture. And that scripture needs to be in context with what God has said uh, should happen. So it's very important. But how will we know if we don't know the word of God? If we don't continue in the teachings of Christ, how will we be able to discern what is truth? And what is error. So it's our responsibility. Uh, to know the word of God. For ourselves. So here. It goes on to say. In order to safeguard themselves. John instructed them to refuse to greet. Or show any semblance. Of hospitality to anyone. Who did not. Uh, bring sound doctrine. You know I was looking at that. And I'm going to give you a couple of scriptures. But some things. Some teachings are not healthy. They're not healthy physically, and they're not healthy uh, spiritually. But when you have time, I want you to look at 2 Timothy chapter 4, uh, verses 3 through 5, and you can run some reference, and I'm sure there are many, many others. And then 2 Timothy uh, chapter 1, verse 13. What is sound doctrine? We need to find and be acquainted with sound doctrine, wholesome teaching, Healthy teachings, things that, edify, things that edify us, that build us up. These are good for our spirit, you know. But all of these other doctrines uh, um, outside of what Christ has taught and what he has directed uh, is not good for us. It's not healthy. Failure to adhere to these instructions uh, would be interpreted as there being in agreement with these deceivers, these deceivers and their wicked work. In verse 12, John closed with a personal note regarding his desire to visit his readers in person so that their joy uh, would be full. You know, when I was reading that, I, I, I couldn't help but think about Genesis uh, and the deception in the garden. Uh, you know, you never get uh, too much or tired of that story, how Satan came in and twisted God's word. And Do you know that caused so much, that caused mankind to fall uh, just that act of disobedience, doing what God told them not to do, uh, caused them to forfeit uh, 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 the Garden of Eden, uh, uh, to be banished uh, uh, from all of the good things that the Lord had in store, had you know, created and blessed them and put them in an environment where all they had to do is maintain. You know, and sometimes we do that. We ruin our blessings. You know, because we become indoctrinated with all of this foolishness, things that God didn't tell us to do. And it will cause you great harm. Uh, it will cause your family great harm. And we have to be careful. You know, it's very important that we stay with the word of God. You have no idea what the Lord may do in your life. But when you abandon ship and you jump off because it didn't happen for you today and God didn't do what you thought he should have done and you found some teaching that 
promised you so many blessings if you would follow them. Didn't Satan do that with Jesus in the wilderness? He said, if you fall down and worship me, I'll give you all of this stuff. You know, but Jesus said, you know, it is written. You should not put the Lord thy God to the test. It is written. We should not put the Lord thy God to the test. Let us obey God at all costs. Uh, verse 13 sends uh, personal greetings. And so here, the closing thought, the book of Second John was written as a warning to believers concerning the danger of entertaining false teachers. This very personal letter to the elect lady and her children provided direct instruction as to how to deal with these false teachers and their distorted doctrine, especially those who were denying Christ's incarnation. Uh, John instructed his readers to continue walking in truth and love and to refuse to provide hospitality to anyone who did not teach the fundamentals of the faith. Now, it would take you, a, it would take a grown up, if you will, or a mature Christian to be able to make this kind of sacrifice. We were talking about it in uh, Bible class last night. Uh, Reverend Armstrong did a wonderful job in explaining. Uh, some things to us about uh, relationship and fellowship with God. But he brought out one of the words that uh, you don't hear too much about, uh, about sanctification. You know, and when we are set apart for the purposes of God, it will cause a lot of friction in your life because it will cause you to let go of some relationships and some fellowships that you've been accustomed to simply because the individual or individuals do not believe what you believe. And I just want to encourage you today, if you are at the crossroads of making a decision about the fellowship, and sometimes it gets very dicey, sometimes it's family, it's loved ones, it's relatives, it's dear friends, but for Jesus Christ, we will have to make some sacrifices. And sometimes these teachings, sometimes it's even uh, uh, with folks who say they know the Lord, their teachings are not what I'm accustomed to. Their belief system is something that I'm not accustomed to. I don't believe God saved me from sin to permit me to continue in sin. So I have to make a decision. I don't believe God saved me through Jesus Christ for me to abandon ship and to abandon what he taught me. And you, you, you go back over and you read the children of Israel. How the Lord brought them out of Egyptian bondage. Look for yourself. God gave them specific instructions about how to live. He gave them commandments. He gave them statutes. He gave them laws. He gave them ordinances. He gave them feasts. He gave them all kinds of instruction that were to be carried on in a perpetual manner. In other words, for life. That they may live a life that is pleasing to him. When he gave them the promised land, he dispossessed the Canaanites and gave the land to his people. He instructed them not to get involved with those individuals. But we know the story. They did it anyway. So my point is when God delivers us. When God brought you out. I know he gave you some instructions. And if he didn't tell you anything else. He told you don't go back. He told you to keep going forward. He told you to walk up right before him. And no good thing will he withhold from you. He told you to obey. Jesus told the same thing to his disciples. To love him and to keep his commandments. So this is what we want to take away from this lesson today. Very powerful lesson with these 13 uh, verses here. And I enjoyed really talking about it in length with you. Because there are a lot of believers who are abandoning the faith. It's a great concern. Uh, they're in the church and they're out of the church. They're with the Lord and they're not with the Lord anymore. You know, so it's, it's a very uh, 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 grave situation. None, it's not hopeless. God is still able. But uh, it's just so much disruption uh, uh, in 
some of the folks' faith, and uh, we hear it all the time. And we want you to know we're going to be praying for you. And as we get ready to close, I want to offer a prayer for us today, uh, even for myself. Uh, as I sit here today and go over this lesson, it takes God to keep me from falling. So let us pray. Eternal God, we thank you again for such a powerful lesson. We thank you for the privilege of being able to share such a word. We thank you for the instructions that you've given. And Father, we can just pray and ask you now in the name of Jesus to help us. Help us keep the commandments. Help us to obey. Give us hearts and minds to be obedient to what you have given us to do. Forgive us of the sin of, of disobedience, oh God, and, and falling away and falling short. But we know, oh God, that you are able to keep us. And the Bible helps us to understand, even when we are, are faithless, that you are faithful because you cannot deny yourself. And Lord, we just thank you now for all of the hearers. We pray for whatever they are going through today, that you would give them the spirit of endurance and the spirit of perseverance, that they would hold fast to your word. Maybe they've lost all their friends and don't think that anyone else cares. But you said in your word that you would never leave us and that you would never forsake us. And we just thank you for Jesus who gave his life and shed his blood for our sins. We thank you again. And, oh, God, all that we have failed at asking, please don't fail in granting. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So we thank and praise God again uh, for being able to share with you another word until such time that the Lord will permit me to speak to you again. We say God bless you.